So in this video, I want to get into the matter of fantasy imagery. Imagery, well, imagery like a red dragon with seven heads, with ten horns, and there are a lot of others, like locusts with, with human faces and women's hair and lion's teeth and... You know, a beast that resembles a leopard with feet like a bear and a mouth like a lion. And what's so distinctive about such fantasy images is that they don't correspond to anything in the real world. And yet, and yet, though such images are unreal, they do provide a realistic means by which to ponder reality. Most of the images in apocalyptic portions of scripture belong to the genre of what we call fantasy. Let me give you an example. In the book of Revelation, there's, there's a beast with, with seven heads and ten horns. There's a woman that's clothed with the sun. There are locusts with scorpions' tails. Uh, by the way, they also have human heads, and, and, and the list goes on. The fantasy imagery doesn't necessarily appear in the objects themselves, in heads and horns and tails, but in their otherworldly arrangement. Now, throughout the centuries, Christian writers have emulated what you find in the biblical use of fantasy imagery, and they do that to underscore the cardinal truths of a Christian worldview. Sort of like a, um, a man's head on a beast's shoulders to highlight the reality that righteousness without truth is, well, it's abhorrent. The use of an imaginary troll uh, to portray an invisible truth. Fantasy imagery, of course, is fraught with danger. And that danger doesn't lie in its use, it lies in its abuse. In Revelation chapter 12, we have St. John describing this enormous red dragon that has seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. His tail, so you get a dragon with a tail, sweeps a third of the stars out of the sky and flings them to the earth. Now, think about it. Interpreting such imagery in a literalistic fashion misses the point of the passage. Not only would one single star, let alone a third of the stars, obliterate earth, but dragons are the stuff of mythology. They're not the stuff of theology. So St. John does not want us to believe that dragons are real, and nor does he want us to believe that a dragon's tail could sweep a third of the stars out of the sky. Instead, well, instead, he wants us to understand the reality of the devil's cunning wisdom. That's uh, manifested by these seven heads. Great power, which is manifested by the ten horns. Authority to influence others, the, uh, the seven crowns or the seven diadems. And by the way, a chapter later, John describes another beast he sees coming out of the sea that has ten horns and seven heads and ten crowns on his horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast, if you've read the book of Revelation, resembles a leopard he has feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. And the dragon gives the beast his power and his throne and great authority. And one of the heads of the beast seems to have been fatally wounded. But the fatal wound had been healed and the whole world is astonished and follows this beast. Well, again, the danger lies in missing the point of such fantasy imagery. To read the Bible for all its substantial worth, it's crucial to read it as literature. And by the way, paying close attention to the things that I've been talking about in the last few videos. 
In other words, paying close attention to form and figurative language and fantasy imagery. And while the scriptures must indeed be read as literature, remember, you and I must ever be mindful that the Bible is not merely literature. Instead, the scriptures are uniquely inspired by the Holy Spirit. As St. Peter, uh, Peter put it, uh, no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own in, in, interpretation, but uh, he, he says prophecy never had its origin in the will of men, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So in the next video, I want to contrast the faithful illumination of Scripture with the fertile imaginations of modern-day prophecy pundits. And I'm going to talk about how virtually all the novel end-time theories you hear promoted on Christian television and radio and read in, in magazines and books begin with a 19th century disillusioned priest, a priest named John Nelson Darby.